Thank you for coming here today. Um, welcome to uh, Wampa more than when um, there's a lot of uh, history here in New England, as we all know. Um, a lot of it right here, right here at Comic Con. Um, can't thank you guys enough for all being here today and to be uh, honest with you guys. You know, uh, even before I was late, I knew. Um, how, how special it was. That it, 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 I had no idea we were going to have this beautiful weather today, um, but I think uh, hopefully all of us are caught off guard with that. Uh, it feels like summer out there. Um, and uh, I personally just wanted to uh, start off today by just literally thanking each and every one of you. you just help yourself to one of those there. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Make sure you get a good one because uh, this bag fell on the way here. I truly appreciate you guys being here, and uh, as many of you may know already about Wampum, it was meant uh, as a gift. It was meant as a sign of tribute. Um, it was meant to capture a story, if not many. Um, and it's also meant to last forever. Uh, so, I hope that you guys uh, took a good one. Carry it with you. Uh, they do have a hole in them. You guys do want to hang it on maybe a string or a piece of leather or something. And, uh, carry it with you. Carry it. Uh, hopefully that spirit will uh, be felt in the time you wear it. They're all good. So, um, this is the uh, gift of reciprocity that um, you guys showed us. Yes, you got some gas money we gave you. Very good. You, you blew off all these beautiful outdoor events. Thank you. All these beautiful outdoor events you could be doing. And you came here. And I honestly can't. It's uh, honestly a. Uh, very grateful for many of you guys coming here. How many of you are? Thank you. Uh, how many of you are here first timers? Yes. Oh, wow. Already winning. <laughs> so again, top tunnel. Uh, that's how we say thank you or thank you all. Top top singular. Uh, but I see a lot of you. So top tunnel. Um, and that's literally just a form of uh, how we have used this, this uh, beautiful resource. I literally call uh, the actual resource the most magical part of New England. Got some smart cookies out here. I'm going to ask all my Narragansett Travel members to hold off on answering this question, but any of you newcomers know what you're looking at here? Sukuhag is what you are looking at right here. Yeah. Sounds familiar, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you know the Dark Shell Clam, and I'm sure we know what part of that clam is being referred to, and how dark and that purple is uh, almost black if you get a really good quality shell, which this one here is. Um, I will pass this resource around, so again, get familiar. Note the uh, thickness of the one side that literally has the deepest, darkest concentration of the purple color. Um, you'll look at the thickness when you turn it sideways, you can literally see the thickness of that one. Uh, pretty good quality shell. Um, there are much thinner shells out there, uh, which also may still have that rich purple. Um, however, for those of you who are familiar with uh, wampum and wampum peak, um, many of you are probably familiar with this here form, um, hopefully. Um, because unfortunately, uh, I do travel extensively as my bio uh, so eloquently exposed, and uh, uh, I have been very fortunate to meet many uh, tribal nations and see you know, their customs and what they value. And um, to know that when I travel outside this region, other people are familiar with Wampum. Um, and it's not something that was just worn fashionably, as it seems turquoise has become. 
Uh, how many of us in this audience own a piece of turquoise? Excellent. I thought I'd see more hands, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, a lot of folks, how many of you folks own marble? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, good ratios there. Uh, I can tell I'm in the hometown crowd. Uh, needless to say, these uh, polls don't go so well outside of the communities here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with the, again, Sukwahug or Sukwahug uh, clam, the actual resource that's being passed around, um, it's the Wampum Peak that we're here to talk about. And for those of you who haven't heard the full uh, version and explanation of that particular word, uh, wampum peak is the white shell or the white bead that was made from the white shells. Um, so as you can see, very dramatic contrast when you can get that really rich, really dark purple, especially if you can get it to run throughout that bead. And uh, any, uh, many shells, I should say, uh, well, uh, the white part of the clan that you are passing around. However, uh, you do have to get obviously a thick portion of that as well uh, to get the proper thickness and quality of the beads that you're looking for. So um, for those of you who are uh, familiar with the actual resource, these here are replicas. Um, so when the Europeans arrived, I believe it was this actual glass version of the beads that were uh, of the Dutch origin, I believe, uh, that the Dutch created. Uh, these glass beads, and uh, they understood the importance to our people, but they didn't understand their value. Um, so, for those of you who have unfortunately, sadly heard, wampum is Indian money. Well, a couple things are wrong there. I'm not from India, and, <laughs> and this is not money. I, I, I try to tell folks every time, it is so offensive and degrading when I think of this in any form of a monetary value. Um, for those of you who haven't heard me paraphrase, uh, I, I can ask a, a Christian, a devoted Christian, uh, what the Bible is worth, and I doubt they're going to put a price tag on it. I hope they wouldn't. Um, I would have to question if they did. Uh, and I'm sure they could send me down to the dollar store, perhaps, to, to get a Bible. Uh, however, again, uh, it's almost, uh, uh, again, derogatory when I look at this in a monetary value. Um, even as a product, um, as many of you would see, I do uh, create gifts and uh, sell many pieces of the wampum, uh, uh, the super home, excuse me, resource. Um, and it's, it's a difficult task. Any artists out here know you, it's really difficult to get the value for the time that we invest now. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with that shell, hopefully many of you are, you're in a, a hub of where they come from. Uh, uh, Rhode Island is known for its clams, particularly its quahog. Just ask Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very proud of their quahogs in Rhode Island. Um, so I, I too grew up here, for those of you who are familiar, right here in Charlestown, uh, right here on the Narragans Reservation. It was uh, in these very waters that my mom taught me how to dig them with my toes. Um, so from the time I was born, I personally had an intimate experience uh, as an adult, as an educator, I've been very fortunate to be able to bring people to my Mashpee community, Mansipi, Great Water. I take them on a tour of the entire community, which also kind of chronologically helps them understand how our community has become, has been overcome, I should say. Um, and when you follow the pond all the way down the Mashpee River and into the bay and into the ocean even, uh, you can literally follow the entire tributary and go through the entire community. And obviously, if you end up in the bay, you're going to take these people, kick your shoes up, and get in there. I show them just like my mom showed me. I show, her, I show my mom's community the way my mom showed me how to dig these clams. And, uh, I have had uh, Jewish children, uh, Israeli children from uh, overseas who come here to uh, unite. Um, they take youth from uh, these areas that are combatant overseas and they bring them here to Ireland, you know, they got wars going on right there in their own country and uh, these folks come over to uh, it's called friends forever uh, they bring them to a neutral ground and try to give them an experience that they can all bond on um, so as uh, a, a Wampanoag bringing Israeli people seeing that pride that these young children have the moment they find their first clan and when you can 
be fortunate enough to have a little pocket knife on you. And for those of us who know you, you shop them, you get them open and get that nice, sweet, salty juice. Uh, anyone who's ever traveled this area and never been able to get past that, that consistency, you know, <laughs> just looking at it, it doesn't obviously look the most appealing. Uh, snot and whatnot. I've never referred to it. Again, don't be disrespectful to our resources here. Uh, but, you know, as I tell people, it's hard to get past that uh, saltiness, of course, you know. However, if you can get to that, that meat, it's a very sweet meat, very sweet meat, uh, very high in protein, uh, high in omega-3. It's uh, very beneficial to you who live here. And uh, again, great resource to introduce to your body, if not your family. So again, introducing this to cultures overseas and seeing that joy, that pride, and being able to feed yourself, being able to feed your family. Um, there's so much more that goes into the process of just gathering your resource. Um, so again, going out to, I can still visit the same waters that my mom brought me to and still get rich, rich uh, quahog and great abundance. Uh, and then, of course, I'm fortunate to have her community as well, many bays to move around. I do my best not to uh, overfish any of these areas. Uh, you have to make sure that there's a lot of people, especially in a commercial shell fishing uh, industry, they'll just, it's kind of like clear cutting the forest, you know, they just go in and get every clam imaginable. Um, when we know that there are good spots, obviously I know I could hit those every day all the time if I wanted. However, I know that there's other spots I need to find. Um, even those white beads, as I, as I mentioned, are also needed. So I do move around and I do my best not to uh, overfish uh, any of the bays. So again, any of us who are out here accessing that resource, it's always good to you know, investigate other areas. Um, and and uh, always keep a database because you never know folks like ourselves need to know. Uh, where are the good clams to be found? Um, so, uh, myself, again, uh, as I tell folks, uh, the turquoise, as far as I have researched, as far as in, in all of my travels, I've never heard of the turquoise being used in the way that the wampum has. Um, the wampum was not just traded, it was literally most importantly used to document things. Um, so again, capture a piece of today in that piece that you now own, and carry that way to share this story. It's literally almost a responsibility now for you. Uh, this uh, historic use of the wampum uh, to dictate very important historic uh, meetings, greetings, things of that nature, uh, literally passed down thousands of years, generation after generation, to, to, to literally hold a piece of material that could have possibly been handed down from the times of Egyptians. And not just hand it down, but your family, your great, 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 greatest elder, grandparent. And you can literally touch and hold and pass that around and see your chief wear it, he or she, looking all proud, looking good in front of other tribes, sharing your history in a proud way. Uh, to myself, like I said to this day, I haven't seen the president walk around with a flag draped around him. My dad used to, but we didn't. No, no, okay. Um, but I've never seen the president do that. Um, and again, we were very proud of our stories, obviously. Uh, dignitaries would be very, uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, careful to, uh, you know, not wear these out, you know, to wear them to special occasions only, possibly. Uh, definitely brought out at specific times to make sure everyone understands this is what this design captures. This is why this, this was made. Uh, myself, uh, one of the fascinating things I've also discovered from studying other cultures and traveling, as you also heard in my bio, uh, the power of the Maori culture. And the Maori are very much uh, in interacted with us during our whaling period. Uh, we did travel all around the world. Uh, any of the coastal tribes here, uh, well known for our whaling. And definitely many of us have remained in places like New Zealand. Alaska speaks of a ship that came from New Bedford and got stuck in their ice. And there are many people from New Bedford that live in Alaska as a result of that. Um, so again, uh, a lot of exchange Hawaii, of course. Uh, but the, the, the Maori of New Zealand, when they tattoo their faces, I think many of us are familiar with that. <laughs> you know, hopefully, if you're out, you are now. <laughs> so the uh, tattoo is the extensive tattooing that they do. Uh, it's a deliberate language, for those of you who are familiar. And uh, it's literally specific placement of specific information. So uh, your your deed to your land goes on a specific part of your face. Your 
your offspring, your children, your descendants, those that came before you go in a certain place. And it's all depicted in a way that as an entire community, the community would have to decide first if you could even get that tattoo. So, you know, a lot of us, you know, we go get those sleeves now, we go down with tattoo poly. Got anything Polynesian? And I have no idea what we're putting on our bodies. Um, permanent thing. And again, the uh, Maori culture is so, so proud and prominent. And uh, to this day, uh, the entire community has to be there when that person gets tattooed. Uh, they, there is a support group for the person who has the gun. You know, they are using modern means now. Um, but the uh, tattoo artist has uh, someone there just, you know, basically spiritually patting them on the back and fanning them down, making sure they're cool and calm, comfortable place. And, uh, they, uh, you know, need any water, and support group like that, probably might have a couple people there to support him. Of course, the uh, individual being tattooed has a support group as well as a tattoo is being applied to them. Um, so it's a very much a community effort throughout. I firmly believe that with the time that it would take to just accrue the beads to make one story, I don't think any one individual is gonna say, I demand my beads get used for this and that. Um, however, obviously, as the power of our democracy has now transcended into what we call the Constitution in the United States of America, uh, every voice was heard and uh, everyone did have input. So uh, collectively, I'm sure there was, uh, just again, as the Maori have to approve, uh, the appropriate use of these beads. So, uh, very fortunate to work at uh, Boston Children's Museum around the turn of millennium. Took on that position, I believe it was, and uh, just stumbled across a whole bunch of uh, good research, uh, as I mentioned in my last program here. Some of it had Don Dove's name on it, and my Aunt Diosa, uh, Aunt Didi, uh, her, her, her research, and my dad's and others. And um, one of those pieces of research that I found was um, not just the slavery, of course, um, but uh, it was the, uh, the beads themselves. It was actually not a, a piece of paper or research. It was in their, uh, I'm trying to remember what they called their, they allowed children to access artifacts. Uh, it was, I'm trying to remember what they called that. Any of the elders here remember what they called that place? I worked there myself, just kind of break that, excuse me. Um, but they basically had this uh, space where uh, everything was packaged in a way that it had a green hand, a yellow hand, or a red hand. If it was a red hand, you had to handle it as carefully as possible, uh, most likely with gloves. Um, if it had a yellow, you could literally pick it up, look at it, you know, move it around. A green hand, if it's a game, play with it. If it's a green hand, uh, smell it, whatever the artifact is, they want as much interaction with that as possible. And uh, this was uh, an item that had been removed from, uh, unfortunately, uh, had to have been some sacred kind of uh, origins. Because I, it was a cuff, I believe, similar to the one that I'm wearing, much smaller, and the beads. I personally, I don't even know if I've seen glass beads today that were as delicate and small as the ones that I saw that day. But it literally blew my mind. Not only just the hole, how did they get the hole that small? The beads themselves so perfectly uniform, each one, and just so small. And today, what you're passing around, what you're looking at, that is a clay replica. So as I mentioned, these are the glass replica beads, uh, those clay beads, uh, they break easy. They're you know, used for craft work like that. I can, I can dance with that and I can wear it and pass it around, as you can tell. But um, the beads that you're looking at on that belt, I would say there are about three to four of the actual wampum beads to make just one of those beads. So if you're looking at the length, is what I'm talking about, the length of these beads, if you could imagine at least three to four, if not more, small beads, just, just that one length. They were so small in great detail and I was so proud, you know, it uh, really blew my mind. And that's when I realized at that moment that, again, beads like those could have possibly took generations to gather to tell one story. And uh, when I was uh, in 2008, I believe it was released. Um, I actually know, I think we did film in 2008. Uh, the We Shall Remain, for those of you who may 
uh, see my face and think I look familiar. Uh, I was very fortunate, honored, uh, it was this huge honor to be asked to portray a uh, young King Philip uh, for the first time it came to life on screen. And uh, very, very honored as, as a man named Anawan, who was the warrior who kept fighting for that man. Um, very proud to carry that name, but to be carrying that honor. Uh, when they cast me, they said they wanted me particularly because of my height. And one of the things that they said was uh, they had read an account that a belt, much like this one here, was seen being worn, would most likely obviously passed down from his father, Master Soda himself, possibly worn at your first Thanksgiving <laughs> in this very same fashion. And they said, draped over the shoulder of that man who was at least my height, it's still draped onto the ground, they said. They said it's still draped onto the ground. And again, if you saw the beads that I saw that day, and the children were seen, to this day I haven't seen any more minute wampum beads than what I saw at the Boston Children's Museum. Um, those were very, very small. Um, many of us are familiar with these tubular style, and you know, about this size is, I want to say, pretty customary for, for many belts. Um, I have seen somewhat smaller, but nothing like I did see that day. So again, it kind of blew my mind, just the, just the time that it took to go out and gather. Um, many of us who have ever gone clamming, you know, it's not easy to just go find these and dig them, and then of course opening them, shocking them. Uh, this is, of course, with the uh, materials and, and tools that were available back then. Um, and then, of course, the actual production time. Um, so uh, as a, a traditional artist, uh, I would have to find a way to fragment this shell here. Uh, a lot of times I would assume, honestly, that many people could possibly gather shells and pieces of shells that were already on the beach. Um, many of you may know that, you know, seagulls and animals such as that, you know, they do shellfish themselves and their way of opening clams and chucking them is just dropping it on a pavement surface or a hard surface rocks and whatnot. So if you do go to uh, anywhere that you know the clams are, are abundant and especially good with the rich purple and you know that those seagulls have been dropping them, then you yourself can obviously find those little tiny uh, corners, if you will, just look for that really thick part. Uh, you can just pocket those pieces. I'm pretty sure our ancestors were definitely taking advantage of that. Um, however, uh, I would have to, you know, uh, find a stick, uh, a good springy one, that I could wrap around uh, the, the fractured shell. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar, that was a, a form of a vise, um, just basically bending a stick to hold the piece of uh, wampum while you began to drill. Um, so this was the traditional uh, style of drilling the actual wampum shell. <laughs> Do I look hard at work? <laughs> Does it look stressful? No. Uh, one of my best things was uh, bringing this down to the daycare. I used to work at the uh, Meshitaka Pequot Tribal Nation, as you guys heard in my bio, and uh, we used to just get, uh, just get somebody put their hand on this side here, and just match my pace here. You gotta let it come up on its own. If you want to spread that hand right like mine is spread over here, and just take over, you gotta keep it moving. You gotta let it come up and wind up and just push mm -hmm. down. And, and then uh, you gotta balance it as well. I'm gonna let go and let me see if you can just, there you go. <laughs> Just like the babies at the uh, <laughs> child, it wasn't hard, right? Uh, it was something that you obviously have, have you done this before? No. Uh, I hope not. Um, so yeah, very good job. Uh, again, uh, something that's easily done. Uh, it could easily be done while listening to these stories about what those beads are telling. Um, all the depictions of uh, oral history, uh, definitely uh, depictions of the. Uh, first coming of, of colonists and things of that nature. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah, what's used for the bit? This one is metal. It's not a metal bit here. Um, obsidian, chair, possibly. Obsidian, uh, just amazingly impressive stone there. Uh, amazingly sharp. Um, uh, they say uh, surgeons still use obsidian. Um, some of them for precision and German steel, I guess, what we will get to this day. Um, so uh, you can use various tools, I'm sure, um, now, of course, but back then, uh, 
most likely the stones. I have seen obviously hand methods where you don't have to mm -hmm. use the uh, pump pumping uh, that I just did, but it's a very efficient tool. Uh, very again, eating them clams. There's some smart bird. <laughs> very proud of our ancestors, very proud of our technology. You know, a lot of people also insult my people when they say it's primitive technology. Mm. Okay. Um, so the insane, I will leave this up here. I'm pretty sure some of you are going to want to try that out as soon as we're done here. Um, so, and again, uh, any other questions? Because I seem to be rambling through a lot. I just can take a pause right here and jump right back into things if folks do have questions about some of the things that I've already mentioned or would love for me to talk about something specific. Go ahead. The interpretation of the stories and the background. Again, up to the community. Um, the uh, two row wampum belt. Probably one of the more simplistic designs you'll probably see. It's literally all dark beads on half of the belt, all white beads on the other half of the belt, and it's literally uh, an actual wampum belt from the time when the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, first encountered non-natives, the Europeans. They made a wampum belt to acknowledge that the first time they ever saw European white people. And uh, Haudenosaunee, anyone familiar with them? Because it's not what you guys probably call them. Haudenosaunee, nobody knows? You said Iroquois. Iroquois, yes. Which is a very French term for those of you who can hear it. Um, La Crosse, that they're attributed with. Um, that was also uh, the stickball that originated from the Oklahoma tribes as they came up here. Tuscarora was the last of the Six Nations. There were five nations that banded together. This was well before colonization. And uh, the man they call Hiawatha was the peacemaker who came about during a time of war amongst the five nations. Uh, I believe it was the Cayuga, the Seneca, the Onondaga, the uh, Oneida, Mohawk, did I say? Because um, that would be the five original, and then the Tuscarora were added as a sixth later. Uh, and again, that was prior to colonization, but it was as a result of the Ice Age and the ice receding, um, that migration. Um, so basically, the uh, Haudenosaunee, the five nations, they were at war, and the Hiawatha came during that time, and he said, look at what you guys are doing. You're destroying yourselves. You're going to kill each other. If you can learn to live together, and work together, and fight together, and bury your hatchets beneath the tree of peace. No one will ever defeat you. And they decided that they were gonna band together as the one Haudenosaunee people, the Longhouse people. And that's what they refer to as the Iroquois Nation. And it's a nation of five different groups of people, originally five nations of people. Um, and now, with the Tuscarora, they are the Six Nations of Iroquois, or the Six Nations Haudenosaunee. And they have a belt that is very, very descriptive. I encourage you to Google. I don't usually lean on technology. I could have probably put together a slide PowerPoint, but giving you guys a homework assignment. Um, some of you can obviously pull out your phones. Um, but if you Google the Hiawatha belt, I believe it is called, um, it's a very, very descriptive picture of the uh, five uh, squares, or four, I guess, on the exterior. The fifth square is right in the center in the tree comes right down the middle, and it's the Tree of Peace in the middle. Um, very, very beautiful, very descriptive design. Um, very proud to know that they couldn't have done that without our beads, without our, our quahog shells. Uh, they are landlocked people, folks. So you can look at all five of those nations, all six now, landlocked. None of them can get quahogs. Very proud to see, no, for real. Our, our history is their history, their history is from our production that and our sharing and, and it just again it just uh, point I'm making more than money I mean like I, 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 it just it literally hurts my soul when I hear it referred to as money so again you guys have homework assignments you guys gotta go home you guys gotta go find some quahogs and you gotta tell me where the good ones are they tell me where those good ones are especially these fat ones you know I want them good fat ones right um, but needless to say <coughs> You have to tell people, you know, about the, the Nanofaganiya, 
Nation, if they're not familiar with this oh, tribe right here. Uh, we have to tell people about, hopefully, my mom's Wampanoag Nation. Now I really met one of the descendants of the people who had turkey with the Pilgrims. Uh, they are still there, and you guys are welcome to come up 4th of July weekend and visit our powwow if you haven't already. Really good time, three days straight. Uh, many vendors selling many wares and whatnot. Um, however, uh, you know, uh, this uh, Pequot, Pequot traditionally, which is again my dad's other nation next door over in Connecticut, for those of you who are familiar, um, they historically had the strongest uh, trade network and, and best quality shell. Um, they, between the Long Island Sound historically and possibly even today, uh, was always known uh, as the largest production and best quality shell again. Um, it's a good, dark, thick, uh, rich purple. And uh, I've been to Shinnecock, Shinnecock, uh, as well as uh, Monica's Vineyard. Haven't really had much activity on Nantucket to interact with, to see how, they're, they're, as far as I know, I haven't seen any wampum production from the Nantucket area, but a lot of artists on the vineyard, and they do have good shell too. However, if you're out at sea, how are you getting this shell to the mainland, let alone all the way to Minnesota? So for those of you who are not familiar, the Ojibwe, as you call them, uh, the Anishinaabe people, as they sometimes refer to themselves, they also use this. I think we all know how far Minnesota is. This is before eBay, folks. This is before DHL, UPS, FedEx. Okay? Good thing we had them long legs, right? They said we could run up to 100 miles within a day. Pretty sure we had some wampum beads on us when they recorded that statistic. Uh, but needless to say, uh, you, had to, you had to get these all the way out there. To uh, Minnesota, I don't know if I personally would get them that far. I'd probably trade them to the Haudenosaunee. They trade them amongst their Six Nations out to the the Oneida are currently in Wisconsin. You know, they they're the keepers of the Western Door for the, the Haudenosaunee people, so they have gone as far west as the Haudenosaunee Nation will go, I guess. And uh, there are some of our people, the uh, Stockbridge, Muncie, and the Delaware, who fled from the King Philip's War era, ended up out in the Oneida territory, and the Oneida people do give them. A portion of their reservation to this day is called the Brotherton. For those of you who are familiar with our, our relatives, Brotherton's out there in Wisconsin. Um, they're all from here, and obviously um, they might have brought some of this with them too as well. I'm sure there's a belt that denotes that. Um, but needless to say, uh, this is so fun. I, how many of you have tripped over this shell at the beach before today? How many of us? How many of us have tripped over? Because you've spotted this at least. I know you guys recognize the second you saw it in your hand. Okay. I bet you guys didn't know all this. Think how many of your family members and friends tripping over this. Possibly their whole lives. I'm looking at a, a well diverse age of group folks here. I'm not gonna say who is what age, but you know. Um think it's no, so because I'm 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 honored to be able to share some of this with some elders who literally lived in New England their whole life, pride themselves on how much of a New Englander they are. But many of them never had any idea about the magic of just the clamshell itself, just the claw. And I hope you guys know your clams by now. I hope you got this. We're going to give you a quick little lesson here. This is not a little neck, folks. This is not a steamer. Okay? Ah, offensive. I go into places that call themselves seafood establishments, restaurants, pros, selling seafood. And when I order steamers and I get handed Little Max, if you guys have had this, a fraud. No, they're like, I don't burn the place to the ground. It's just hysterical. So needless to say, um, this is a quaffle. Um, for those of you who are familiar, you guys know what I'm talking about. Them steamers are really good. Dude, some of them you don't even need butter. But that's about all you need. A little bit of butter. You know, some of these you might put a little Tabasco on. You know, it's a little salty, sucking these down. Um, and personally, like I said, I usually try to get the little ones, you know, the cherry stones or the little nice are much better for me to, uh, you know, palette straight down. Something this size or bigger, stuffies. <laughs> good stuffies, yeah, got chowder. I, I have yet to really get a good chowder recipe, but I am a big fan of the uh, clear broth. What is that? That's Rhode Island chowder, if I recall. And uh, my mom, even though she's a master Wampanoag, and we, her, her cooking traditions all stem from the Cape Cod area, um, she specifically said they always had clear broth and you put like canned milk or something in it to make it creamy once it got to your, to your, your bowl, to 
your serving. And uh, that was just to cool it off and to your taste buds. But all that thick stuff you guys are ordering, <laughs> can you please complain? <laughs> no, you, you really need to. You guys honestly think that's healthy for you? I don't even want to know what they're thickening this other stuff with these days. No, for real, think about it, guys. Do you really want your families eating that? No. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that. They, they call it the New England chowder. I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm literally coming with my next t-shirt. My first t-shirt, Party Lake is 1491. Um, they didn't kill our buffalo. For those of you who didn't know, I am a New England native. This is my buffalo. This is my turquoise. And a lot of people who have lived in New England their entire life don't even know that. Um, so again, that's a very, very important lesson that we have to share. Um, my Production line online is First Light Fashion. Um, anyone who wants to access uh, any of these shirts, uh, my next T-shirt will say "Your Chowder Sucks." <laughs> 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 I was wondering if there's a translation for the word wampum or a description. Wampum, as with Wampanoag, people of the First Light. Wamp implies light, so Wampum Wampum Peak is the white or white bee. Sukwahog was the dark or dark show. And what was the method to polish Smoothing. them smoothly? Yeah. Um, so uh, a stone, a, uh, two things I want to say you would find in pretty much every uh, native community up and down this eastern seaboard where these grow. By the time you get down to like Maryland, I want to say, not very much purple in that area from up here. And, Chesapeake Bay and LA, you know, you probably get these plants, but they're not going to have that purple. It's something about the perfect variables we got here, the tide, the color, the, 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 the currents, the um, temperature changes, the solidity possibly of what, uh, there's so many variables, but they're perfect right here. You don't find this anywhere else in the world. Ocean's all over the world. Clams are all over the world. Something special about our ocean right here. And um, the uh, Canada, I want to say like Nova Scotia area, you're probably going to, you know, you're not going to get it. So, I want to say anywhere in that area where people were producing wampum, um, there would be a, a stone with a groove in it. There would be a pole for the dance that many of us know as the war dance and um, certain things that they said there was always a pole. I've seen many images in every village always had a pole for them to dance around. And somewhere in that village there would be a rock that had a groove in it, a nice sandy sandstone, hopefully. Just a little groove, just a little groove pecked in or etched in over possibly thousands of years ago. And that way, when you got that little chunk and you drilled it out with this drill and you put it on a little piece of string and you did it again and you did it again and you filled that piece of string with those drilled chunks, you can run that entire strand through that groove of sandstone and that's how his beads would match your beads and their beads and everybody's beads in the same community. Perfect. Can I speak about the, um, is it Jolly Rancher? Exchange value um, and to it, and I was wondering if you could tell me more about the exchange culture. It sounds Pilgrims like needed things. No, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> no, that's the breakdown of the valued system. Well, I was wondering, um, much, uh, are you talking uh, trade? Like, uh, I don't know. Maybe you need to clarify. No, it, um, sort of like gift exchange. Um, it, it sounds, it sounds a bit like what, and I don't know very much at all, but a bit like the sort of potlatch tradition. Um, Within the community, the how the beads. With, how did they were created? Were, they, for, for the so, they so like I tell people, when we get horrible presidents like Trump, and we gotta wait like four years to get rid of this guy, like yeah. we got rid of him the day he was in office, and I, you know, you moved, you, nobody would be in his community, <laughs> and definitely wouldn't be making him no beads. <laughs> okay, so like, I guess the the process of commemoration and also the the because thank you for this this lovely thing. So it was just a, you, you would do it because you cared about your community, you wanted these stories in your community, and you'd be busting these beads out every day while you're watching your soap operas or whatever you got to do. You got to get those beads out because you're, you're proud to be part of this community. And you want to show that. You want to show your community can produce things like this and what quality and all that. And, um, so, yeah, they just, you're just giving them constantly. They were just being made to give, to, to give, to give to the chief. The chief could give them to others, could use it in the community. Yeah. It was a sense of honor. It's honoring. Instead of going to the polls and the ballot on November, 
you, you, you constant or you pull back when they're not doing their job right you know what i mean like uh so yeah it just reflects on and there was other things like harvests and things like that you know an excessive harvest was always given to your chief and well no there's a widow and she had a lot of on her plate because she had to do everything by herself and then husband in her life and she couldn't farm as much and she might need some of that or maybe there was a drought in the whole community so wasn't able to ration what they thought they needed or make what they needed so they have some surplus but um but uh, the beads themselves just I, I don't know if anybody would just like make beads and hold on to them you know and like mm -hmm. what, like like maybe even trying to go to another community i don't think that would ever happen i think you would literally just make those beads as much as possible within the community and just make sure you gave them to the chief and it was up to them to do with it as they needed somebody back there i'm sorry yes um not just like things, but they have upwards. Hubbubs? And I know they don't have one pump as like um Talk like the game? Like a, the chip. Yeah, yeah my game piece is a hubbub. Uh, game piece is a wampum. But white white on the back and purple on the front. And I know you say that they're on wampum because the value is running white. They use that for gambling, the wampum. Well, are we talking Foxwoods or something? Can they trade that? Like, are you talking Foxwoods? Because I think some of us were old enough. I don't know if they still have it, but they have the wampum club. I don't, I don't know if they still have that. How big are the chips? Do you have any of them? They have a wampum? Uh, which chips are you referring to? It's a Native American game. It's a dollar yeah, I make them. They're like five pieces. I usually make them nice little round. There's a bunch of purple on one side. When you flip it over, it's already white on the other. Anybody who wanted to play hubbub with uh, coins, you can have uh, uh, heads and tails tell you. Uh, some places use bones uh, that are uh, uh, designed on one side and maybe blank on the other. But uh, they're basically like, 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 uh, like little game tokens at that respect. But not, not disrespectful by any means because you're still using the shell in a, in a, in a useful way. This shell is still very abundant. This is a renewable resource. We're very, very fortunate. This is a renewable resource. And this is something that we, I know for a fact, I, I, I want to say Narragansett Tribe, you guys uh, actively cultivate your shellfish too. Yeah. I know we have oyster beds and things like that, quahogs, uh, aquaculture, you know, that we're actually growing. So um, this is renewable. Um, and again, some, some of them, like you can, I, I, I want to say they messed around with genetic modifications and things like that but you know a lot of times it's just trying to keep the again what was ever in that bay because sometimes if you bring and introduce a different one it can contaminate the bay and cause a lot of problems that we would never want to lose this resource so again i'm very very fortunate they didn't slaughter our buffalo but as a resource it's it, it you know the woods the rocks uh, we use them in so many different ways you know so we have to wait seven days after storm to start the Maybe you do. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry to hear that. Is that what they're doing to you guys? Uh, again, as tribal members, uh, I, I was very fortunate with our, our Massachusetts Wampanoag tribe. Uh, they've given us uh, uh, our hunting and Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights throughout the entire Commonwealth, um, mm -hmm. even though we're attributed traditionally to the Cape Cod area originally, obviously that area has been heavily encroached upon, very hard to survive on their period, let alone off the land. And uh, they do allow us access to the entire Commonwealth and its resources. So, and I actively again pursue that, you know, um, <laughs> to make sure that people know that you know we are here and we do have these rights to continue accessing these resources, particularly this one, of course. So you go to somebody's mm -hmm. house and they got their mansion right on your good plant spot. Like, hey, get out of my bay. You're in my backyard. <laughs> Why didn't I ask you to put your house there on my clam bed? This bed's been here for thousands of years. And I'll have my children with me. The police will be trying to call me out of the water. I said, you can come and get me or you can wait. <laughs> but I'm out here showing my child how to be a Wampanoag. So it's safe to go along after I, that's what it sounds like, I, I would assume. Yeah. I know that most places they got like a colored flag or something to let you know if it's a safe day or not. Because they can, they can shut them down quick, you know, uh, those red tides come in quick, and especially in the hot weather, you know. A lot of people say uh, all, the, all the seafood tastes better in cold water anyway. So. I was wondering if there's any um, understanding of why some of the shells are Again, it's the, I, I don't have the exact scientific 
variables, but again, it's a current and uh, uh, do I understand your question now? Because well, you're talking like the shell you're, itself? We're, when you go looking at them, many more, you look at coho shells on a beach. So yeah. many more are white than are purple. I can be in a bay and they're all white in one part of the same yeah. bay, but I can maybe find some purple ones in another part of the bay. And I don't know what, what's changing. There isn't like an indigenous knowledge or story about why that is. I personally haven't come across that one. So I guess I cram maybe too many other stories in the head. Yeah. Yeah. That one. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I haven't heard that one in particular. Um, unfortunately. Yes. Um, how how long does would it take, or how I mean, historically how uh, uh, how long would it uh, would it take to produce a single wampum bead with a stone drill? Uh, I I want to say I've actually seen it done within minutes. Okay. Depends on the bit. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, and actually, with a stone drill, I'm trying to think. Uh, honestly, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it could could be within minutes. I really don't. Know. And obviously, if I grew up, if this gentleman just did it right in front of us, like immediately, had never done it. I can easily get a lot better if I do it every day. You know what I mean? Like the practice. Of, I don't do it all the time. You know, just because you know, I, I I I have a drill. I have to spend the amount of time that I should to get that process down. So. I'm sure we could both expedite now that they know how to do it. We can expedite it and we can yeah. make it faster. And I'm sure they're cranking them out. Mm -hmm. yeah. But mm -hmm. it's a very fast yeah. production. So, you know, if you get the right bit, the shell, you can get right through it. And especially some of those small beads that I saw. Yeah. You know, they were very small beads. So uh, some folks were asking, I thought you were talking about like the value of how did it become money? Obviously, many of us know the colonists interpreted many things and interpreted them entirely wrong. Uh, my father seems to think that he could find far more information in Roger Williams' writings, and simply because he observed he was asking questions. You know, he wasn't just implying his own European Eurocentric colonial views on what he was observing. So um, the Europeans, like I said, uh, other than uh, they needed things, you know, like outside of the uh, beaver itself, uh, we were probably the highest trade commodity out of this area. Um, they needed beaver from us. We hunted the beaver, um, and uh, they didn't know how to hunt. For those of you who are familiar with the fox and the hound, that wasn't just a, a Disney storybook. That was how Europeans hunted, and it wasn't for food, obviously. You don't eat foxes. That's carnivore. I don't know what was going on with that, but that was their extent of hunting, and they didn't know how to get beaver, and let alone can it all nights like we did. Um, so they literally were trading whatever they could because uh, the Mayflower showed up in debt. I mean, the Mayflower was expensive, all the provisions, they were poor. They were very poor. So so poor, nobody in that whole colony, very one or two people could read or write. Most of the entire first colony of pilgrims here in Plymouth, they didn't even have the money to afford an education to read and write um, working. So they, they needed beaver, and they needed to find a way to produce that. Um, so they came up with these fake beads. And that's how they were using it, like money. So again, um, yeah, that's how that worked into the monetary value, which again was uh, just, they needed things. Uh, when I tell a lot of folks about the trade that we had with them, uh, I can only imagine, like, it's pathetic. I mean, when I when I try to trade with audiences, I do a performance where I reenact time, and you know, it's like they hand me a cell phone or something. And they, you know, uh, we didn't need any of those things. Like a lot of people, the Axis, uh, the first Vikings that were here. Uh, well, actually, uh, Giovanni de Verrazano, 1524, 100 years before the 100 years before the Mayflower washed ashore, and uh, he said that he saw a gentleman wearing an axe head, iron axe head around his neck as a neck job. Yeah, he checked this out. I got this. You know, you, you get one of these. They're not available on eBay. Um, so needless to say, he was just wearing it. And a lot of people would be like, well, why didn't they, they were too stupid to put a handle in it. Why wouldn't they put a handle? Wouldn't that revolutionize the whole wood gathering industry? And of course not. You sat back and watched the tree burn. You mm -hmm. didn't have to cut it down. And if you knew the trees that were here in New England, if I handed any of you guys an axe, <laughs> nobody would want to cut it down. No, for real. If you guys knew the trees that were here in New England, five men holding hands, they said, couldn't get arms around the average tree in New England. So I'm not cutting down with no axe, no chainsaw. Good luck. Paul <laughs> Bunyan. <laughs> So needless to say, just set fire to it. You know, it's just a lot of their tools, glass and things like that. Uh, once they shattered, it broke of no use whatsoever to the colonists. And 
we would take those and we'd fracture those into arrowheads and things like that. So one man's trash, another man's treasure. But a lot of it was curiosity items, like a blanket, a blanket, a lot of blankets they said that were traded, like the wool blankets that were uh, originally traded to the colon from the colonists. Um, they would take each strand of fiber out of those blankets and take the entire blanket apart strand by strand and just incorporate those colors into their weavings. Um, saves them the time of going out and making a little string and dyeing it that color, but they'd rather just have that fine detail. Um, so, and, and the wool, uh, uh, you don't want to wear wool in areas you don't want to wear wool. So it um, wasn't the most comfortable to begin with either. So again, especially the stuff like beaver, you know, my friend Justin Beaver here, you know. <laughs> so, and again, I do have some uh, items up here that uh, if they are of interest to you guys, you know, again, like I said, first like fashion, you can send your family there. Holiday season's coming up. Um, you guys want to give them a piece in New England that will really mean something. I always tell people, like, when they buy any of my items, like, you know, every story is what you make of it, you know, uh, the circle earrings, uh, circle life, the seasons, uh, everything comes full circle. Life in itself, it's so symbolic of everything. Life itself is a circle. I mean, our homes were a circle, our gardens were a circle, trees, everything, moon, sun. Um, as far as the diamonds, four directions, triangle places, uh, pieces, the three sides, the mind, the body, and the spirit, um, anything that you might feel uh, speaks to you in these items. But when you gift it to somebody or wear it yourself, put a little of your spirit into it before you gift it to somebody. I always usually have a parent who's buying a gift for themselves in front of their children. And their children will be all depressed, disappointed. And I say, yo, you just don't realize mommy's really buying this for you. Mommy's going to wear it and mommy's going to hand this down to you. So mommy's going to take care of this so that she can hand it down to you. And you're going to have to hand it down someday. You're going to hand it down to your children someday. Yeah. And you're going to have to remember this really tall, really handsome. Funny guy, you know, charming, charming, you know. Humble, though. you got to remember, he was humble. And uh, you have to capture the details of those stories, and you have to pass these things on. And so, again, um, I'll be sticking around. I want to say with maybe at, at the time of, uh, I don't want to keep anybody. I know we started late. I am more than happy to continue with more questions and answers. I'm pretty sure many folks would love to hear more about any of this. Um, but I do also want to make sure folks have an opportunity to perhaps try this drill out or, you know, obviously look at anything that they have of interest in.